episode number nine with baseball legend Marquise Grissom. Welcome to The Art of Excellence, a show about people doing extraordinary things in their lives. I'm your host, Glenn Zweig. Thanks for joining me. My guest today is Marquise Grissom. Marquise is a former professional baseball player. He led the National League in stolen bases in 1991 and 92. He was a member of the National League All-Star team in 93 and 94, and won four consecutive Golden Gloves. He joined the Atlanta Braves in 1995, where he helped them win their first and only World Series. In all, he played 17 years in the majors, hitting 227 homers, stealing 429 bases, and finishing with a lifetime batting average of 272. Today, he runs the Marquise Grissom Baseball Association a foundation he started which teaches kids how to perform at their highest levels both on and off the baseball field. Marquise, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the show. Thanks, Glenn. Thanks for having me. You grew up with 14 brothers and sisters. I want to go way back here. Did you love having all those siblings, or did you find it hard to have any sort of attention? Well, I loved having all the um, brothers and sisters. I think um, my parents did an excellent job of raising us to um, collaborate with each other, depend on one another, take care of one another. And and those um, way, those kind of ways to really just love and become a family. And I think I give my mom and dad all the credit for allowing us to be ourselves. And they did give each and every last one of us the attention that we needed to excel uh, in life and to that next level. You didn't exactly have a cozy lifestyle when you were growing up. I read that you didn't have any air conditioning and you had to draw water from the well to cook just to have drinkable water in the house. Did you view sports as a ticket to escape that life? Was that part of the driving motivation for you? Uh, I think so. I think in the beginning, uh, at at a young age where, you know, my mom and dad to see them, see how hard they work to provide for us um, with little or no money. And, uh, but being able to, work hard at a young age that kind of um lured me to sports and uh, i learned how to work at a real young age and then to be able to learn how to work at baseball football basketball things that i love to do outside of working at home and being around my mom and dad um sports they were um a kind of an outlet for me to go um let off some steam um get away from the house from the hard work, I was kind of running from it, too, because uh, we, we worked. Everybody had to work. And um, sports, it really was that outlet to where I can go. Um, learn how to become a fine young man, what my parents had taught us to do. You know, respect others, work hard no matter what you do, and learn how to be a giver at all costs. You grew up in a fairly rough neighborhood, was part of this to keep you safe in terms of keep you off the streets? Pretty much. I think um, I wasn't a big guy that I didn't see my older brothers and sisters in the streets much. They pretty much worked and had jobs, worked with my parents. And when they were old enough to work, they had their own jobs. So I really wasn't a street guy, but the streets were there. You know, the drugs were there, the gangs were there. How about friends of yours? How about people you grew up with? Were they involved? Yeah, it was a lot of my friends. Uh, I see um, growing up as a young kid, 8, 9, 10 years old, going in the wrong direction. But I think in our neighborhood, we had the nucleus of about 20 or 30 families who were well-grounded that were into um, doing things the right way that really stirred me and my family. We all kind of went in the same direction of trying to protect one another. And, and, I, and we still have that bond to this day. We're in that community where we get together every September of every year and, and reunite and rekindle what we started down there, the legacy of just being uh, the best people that we can be. We all had a little nothing, but we provided for each other and we learned how to survive with each other. And and that alone, um, you know, ran me into sports and trying to do the right thing at all times. So we had a pretty good neighborhood. It was rough, but um, 
you know, we prevail, we prevail and we provide for one another. I don't want to go too off track, but when you look at the people you knew that ended up in gangs, ended up selling drugs, is it that they didn't have the right support system in their families with their friends? Or was there something else you think that determined whether you stay on the right or the wrong side of the track, so to speak? You know, even growing up then, um, I seen the difference, the difference between those kids and a lot of kids in our neighborhood. We, we lived in a neighborhood where there were houses and we had this rough apartment complex up the street from us less than a mile, which were most of the, the violence and the gang uh, stuff was going on. And I noticed then that a lot of those kids didn't have two parents in the household. We were fortunate enough and blessed enough to have our mom and dad in the household. That whole neighborhood, pretty much 90% of those kids that lived in our neighborhood had their mom and dad figure in the household their whole life. And, 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 and as I got older and I noticed that those kids probably didn't have the same support system that we had. And that was the biggest difference that I noticed in those kids and our kids in our neighborhood. And, um, And there's a lot of those kids learned a lot from those parents in our neighborhood who were dad to some of those kids. So that was um, that was the biggest difference I've seen in those kids and and the kids in our neighborhood. Were your parents pretty strict with you growing up? I think I think the basic stuff, I wouldn't say they were strict. You know, you you get up and you uh, you go chop the wood, you draw the water from the well, you do your chores and you go to school and you learn. And and uh, I'll feed you and provide for you and clothe you, and you do your part and I'll do my part. And anything outside of that was not tolerated. And I thought that was fair. And to be um, that supportive in everything that we we done growing up as kids, our parents did an excellent job of raising us uh, with respect and love for one another. And and like I said earlier, to be able to to provide for someone else besides yourself we had little our neighbors had little but you know it was all about what we can do for other people so you played multiple sports baseball basketball football i assume the big the big three when did you first think seriously about pursuing baseball as a professional when did that first enter your consciousness that this could this could maybe be a reality one day well it was my it was my 11th grade year um I went to a tryout with a friend of mine. Uh, they said the Cincinnati Reds were having a tryout here in DeKalb County um, Community College. And you had to be 18 to go, and I was 17. And uh, I really wanted to go. And I, so I went in, and, and I lied to the guy and told him I was 18. I was a senior. <laughs> and, I, and I went out there, and I tried out. And all of a sudden, you know, after the tryout, the guy kept about three or four guys that he wanted to see again. So, you know, I ran to 60 again. I threw from the outfield again. And he was like, how old are you, son? I said, I'm 17, sir. And um, he said, you know, you have to be 18 to be out here. And I was like, well, I just thought I would come out. I'm going to be a senior next year. Maybe you can come back and look at me next year. And he ended up really wanting to draft me because I was one of the top three players out there. And I told him I had to go back to school one more year because I was a junior. I'm an upcoming senior. And um, – he said, I tell you what, you come back next year, same place, same time. So I ended up going back to the trial again next year, and lo and behold, they'd offer me, offer me $25,000 to sign a contract. And um, that was the first time I thought, wow, somebody offering me some money to play something that I love to do. And I ran home and I told my mom. But surely you thought about this before that point. I mean, this is where it became a reality. But growing up as a kid, when you were a super talented athlete, you didn't think about, hey, one day maybe my dream could be to be a professional player. It just never entered no, your consciousness? No, it, it didn't. No, because I was a football player. I wanted to play in the NFL. And I played football. I love football. And I was a quarterback since I was a little kid, a running back quarterback. And I thought football was my ticket. I really didn't. I didn't see baseball as okay. I'm gonna get drafted. The draft is coming up. I didn't even that didn't even never enter my mind. It was it was when the guy offered me twenty five thousand dollars to go play baseball that they were gonna draft me, the Cincinnati Reds, and I was like, money to play baseball. 
and that's when it registered. And I came back the next year, and I ended up getting drafted out of high school again by the Cincinnati Reds, and I decided to go to college because I wanted to play football. <laughs> so I wanted to go to a school where I could play football and baseball, and, and a lot of schools wouldn't allow me to do both. So I ended up going to Florida A&M University. To, to get to that point where you were getting these offers uh, by the time you were not even finished with high school, you must have had an incredible amount of discipline, willpower, focus to succeed at that level. I'm curious what kind of work ethic was entailed along the way. How often did you practice? Did you attend baseball camps? Did you have personal coaches? Like, What did it take to get to that point where someone's saying, here's $25,000? to come join our organization? I think it was a accumulation of all three sports. I never had a break. And going to, back to the question you asked me earlier, I played sports just to make sure I wasn't going to get in any trouble, but I made sure I wasn't going to get in any trouble. So I played all three sports, sometimes four sports. I ran track two my eighth grade year. And just to give myself something to do so I don't have that idle time during the, during the off season or have a break because I knew I was going to be working at home, so the rest of my time I would be playing sports. And that's how uh, the sports really took me over the edge to become that kind of guy to invest that kind of time and work ethic in it. My parents instilled a work ethic in me at an early age, five, six, seven years old, you know, learning how to lay bricks, make, make mortar mix um, on a cement plant with my dad uh, to do construction work to build houses and build roads. My dad did all that stuff back when he was coming up. And not only speaking of that, he spent 39 years at Ford Motor Company where he retired from Ford. And then he did handyman work where he, he did just about anything. And um, that work ethic came from him. So in playing all these sports, um, it was easy for me to go out there and work on my craft. If I was going to play football, I was going to work on it. If I was going to play baseball, I was going to work on it. And, I, whatever season it was, I worked on that sport for that season. And it was no doubt about it whether I was going to half do it or, you know, I'm just going to play baseball, I'm just going to play basketball. No, I went out there and I worked at it and I concentrated and I did my homework on what it was going to take for me to be the best that I can be in all those sports. Let's talk about the odds of anyone becoming a professional baseball player. About 6% of high school baseball players will go on to play at the college level. Roughly 10% of those NCAA athletes will ever get drafted by a major league baseball team. Now that's just to make it into the minor leagues. From there, only about 3%, 3% of those will ever wear a major league uniform. So in total, it's about 0.02%, one out of every 5,000 high school ball players who will ever make it as a professional one in 5,000. So how in the world did you, Marquise, manage to defy those staggering odds? Hard work, discipline, focus, determination. I think you have to have a combination of all those things. And then along the way, you may pick up one or two more uh, things that will help you get there. But then you have to turn it up another notch to stay there. So it's hard to get there, but it's tougher to stay. But, you know, I just, I worked, I worked, I worked, and you wasn't not going to outwork me. I studied, I studied, I studied, I studied the game. Football, basketball, baseball, it didn't matter. And um, I just wanted to be the best. And uh, the determination, you know, watching my dad, and listen to some of the stories. You got to you got to remember my my dad is 94 years old and I just lost my mom who was 93 years old and to hear the stories, you know, at 5 6 7 years old that my dad worked for 50 cents a day picking cotton. You know, you may hear these stories um in a book somewhere and uh but my parents experienced that to to hear that come out of his mouth and my mom's mouth and see the way they worked and provided for us, it was no doubt, doubt in my mind at the age of 10, 11, 12 year old that I was going to become something. Didn't know what, but I was going to become something. And I was going to make my mom and dad proud and hopefully 
pick up the slack where they paved the pavement to that far and hopefully I could pick up it pick the pavement up right there and carry it for another fifteen hundred years. I know a lot of professional athletes hate the term natural athlete. It implies that there wasn't a ton of work along the way, which of course there was. But let's be honest, it's not like you were the only kid working their tail off to try to realize their dreams in professional sports. Uh, A lot of kids were putting in the time, making all the requisite sacrifices. But, But you got there, and most of them did not. Was there anything else? Is there some talent, perhaps, that's there that not in absence of hard work, but along with it, can allow that talent to flourish, and maybe others just don't have it? I think a combination of both. Uh, um, A lot of kids, uh, you know, through the hard work, you learn so much about yourself. And I just think the the better you know yourself, the better off you're going to be. That's in sports. That's in your job. That's as a parent. That's in anything that we do. You know, along the way, I I had to learn that if I'm going to be an athlete, I have to start eating right. I have to get the proper rest. Along the way, I'm learning these things as I get one year in, two years in, three years in. You have to exercise more than just play baseball. You also, as you get older, you have to get up and get something going, get the blood flow, blood flow going. And so I can be at the top of my game when that time's come to perform. I had to learn that along the way. You got to drink the proper amount of water. I didn't know that. I, sodas, McDonald's. You know, I, I, had to, I had to really eat right and focus on being a machine versus, okay, I can have whatever I want to have. And all that stuff changed. And, and if I didn't see other guys do it along the way, I see how they fell off because they stayed out late at night. I've seen how other guys fell off because they brought problems to the ballpark and couldn't stay focused for that period of time. And 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 you got to remember it's 162 games a year plus spring training where you play about 25 games. So you, you, you're playing almost 200 games in 240 days. So it's a grind. Everybody can't do that. Everybody can't play high school ball. Everybody can't play college ball. But what separates those guys is the determination the work ethics, the attitude, and and really the attitude of gratitude. Once you have any kind of success, it always has to be the attitude of gratitude, whether you have that kind of success or not, because in all the failing process, you learn so much. But so many people, you know, during the bad times, it weighs on them for a long period of time. And the longer it lingers on you, the worse it's going to be. But the sooner you can turn that negative into a positive, I think you've gained, and for me, I used to say it all the time, as soon as I turned the negative into the positive, I already won. I, I, I won that battle because I took the positive out of each and every experience and added it to my life and added it to my game. And it, it made me better, made me stronger to the, to the point where I felt like for years, for maybe 15 out of the 17 years, I felt like I had body on my own. Nobody could penetrate it because I wasn't going to let anybody in. Family member, friends, parents, sister, brother, kids, and and that's not a negative thing. It's a it's a it's a it's a focus thing. It's a determination thing to be the best that I can be. These people are paying me money. I'm putting on a uniform to perform, and people are coming paying their money to come watch me play. I have to give them all I got each and every day, and not cheat them or myself. At 24, 25 years old, I learned that. And I think that's what kept me on the field that many years and to the point where I couldn't play at the level that I wanted to play at. So it ended up in, in me retiring. So it was, a, it was great, though. But the determination and focus is, is the key to success for me. Usually in baseball, it's different from basketball, football, where you jump from college your first year, your second year, and, and uh, jump right into the big leagues. Baseball has got this farm system. Usually people are paying their dues for years and years and years in the minor leagues before they eventually, if, if, because again, it's only 3%, if they ever get bumped up at all. You get to the minor leagues, and the very next year, you get drafted by the Montreal Expos. The very next year. Were you surprised at how quickly that happened? 
Uh, nope, not not stemming from from high school. I had got drafted out of high school, so I knew I had a chance once I go to school, go to college, to get drafted again. And after that, after they offered me offered me uh, to come play with Cincinnati, and I just knew then that I had a shot to play professional baseball. So they offered me money. I turned it down and go to college. And I'm like, I just got to go to school and do well and uh, play hard and continue to put my numbers up. Maybe they'll come looking for me in a couple more years. And that's what happened. And I was getting myself prepared to become um, a professional baseball player at that point because uh, I didn't get an opportunity to play football at Florida a and I kind of wanted to go out there and play. They asked me to come out and play, and I kind of went out and seen the team, and I didn't think I would – I was kind of like a spoiled brat. I didn't think I was going to have the opportunity to start as a freshman in football. And, and and I seen the quarterback, and I seen the backup quarterback, and I really didn't think they could play with me at that at that age, even though they were there. And I think the excuse from the coach was that, you know, I, I didn't know the system, and I thought I could learn the system. So, you know, like a spoiled brat, I just got my baseball bat and ball and went down to the baseball field and just started working on my baseball game by myself. No other players were there probably for the first month and a half. And I started running and conditioning and hitting off a tee and taking batting practice off the tee and just getting my baseball work in and couldn't wait till the season started. You didn't think about pulling a Bo Jackson and doing both of them at the same time? Well, I did. You know, that's the reason I didn't play football because I didn't think I was going to start. So it wasn't, it wasn't satisfying. I always wanted to play football. And going to, it's not a knock to Florida a and It's just like I, I was a spoiled brat. I thought I could go out there and start right away. And when I realized I wasn't going to start, the football days were over. That was it for me. I just focused on baseball at that point. And that was my first year of college where I probably was out there four days on the football field and just really watching and observing, but really not, not really thinking that um, I was going to play because I knew I wasn't going to start. You talked about the work ethic entailed to some degree. I want to pull back the curtain just a little bit more. We see what's happening during the few hours when a game goes on, uh, but there's obviously a lot behind the scenes in between games. How much time do you actually spend maintaining your skills, keeping yourself in shape, preparing for the next game, preparing during the off season? How, how many hours are we talking about? How much work are we talking about? Um... One typical year, I think early in my career, say to just say the first year of my career, regular season we play 152 games, I think, in A-ball. And I would go to the park early, take about 200 swings. And, you know, we got a 7 o'clock game, probably get there about 1, take my extra work, go back in the clubhouse, sit down for a while. We start our regular work at 3 and go through the reg- regular routine, play the game, be done with the game. Sometimes after the game, go hit. Sometime after the game, go run. It all depends on where I felt like I needed to improve and do that same routine. And then during the off season, it's take a week off and it's right back to work. You know, I, I didn't take too much time off um, during the off season. Um, you got to remember, it's a job. They're paying me to do a job and you have to put the work in. So I would work during the off season probably four hours a day. Was that on your own volition, or were there requirements when you're a ball player that they say, here's what you need to be doing in between the seasons? There's no requirement. They give you um, some ideas on what they think you should do, but and there's nobody's going to tell you that you got to do anything at the, at the major league level. You don't have to do anything, minor league level either. You, if you're going to stay around, you better do these things. It's a no-brainer that you must do these things. And right now, as a kid, you should be doing this in – Little league, high school, college, minor league, it doesn't matter. If you're going to be an athlete, you should you should work on your craft. That was a good thing about the work ethic as a little kid, how I used to ride my bike from Red Oak all the way to Five Points downtown. And that was my exercise so I could, you know, I thought I could ride a bike as fast as the cars would go on Highway 29. They're only going 35 miles an hour, so I would try to keep up with the cars. And I couldn't wait to, I couldn't keep up with the cars on a Huffy, but when I got me a 10 speed bike, I could. So I'm riding down Roosevelt 35 miles an hour, and my mom not understanding how I can go all the way downtown and back less than two hours on a bicycle. And that was my form of exercise. You know, in high school, I would just get, drop me off right here, and I'll jog two and a half miles home. I just had to get my exercise in because I wanted to be the fastest guy, I wanted to be the strongest guy, I wanted to be durable. 
And I didn't want to leave nothing second to chance. I just wanted to be the best that I can be because when I stepped on the field, I wanted to be the best guy on both teams, not just on my team. I wanted to be the best guy. And not saying this is not bragging. I just wanted to be the fastest, the strongest, the smartest. You didn't want to have to look back and say, gosh, I could have done a little bit more. I, I could have prepared myself better physically or mentally. You want to feel like you've, like you said, you haven't left any stone unturned. You've done everything. If is a bad word. So of all the sports, baseball seems to be the most streaky. What was the worst slump that you had, if you can remember? I mean, I want, to, I want you to walk us through the lowest moment you had in your professional career as a ball player. Oh, man, that's, that's easy. It had to be when I first started. I got drafted and um, didn't really know where Montreal was. <laughs> and got drafted by the Expos, and they sent me to Jamestown, New York. And I go to Lantana, Florida, to spring training, and that was my first time flying ever. And they sent us to send me to A ball in Jamestown, New York. And um, we get there, moving, selling in this country town in the mountains. It's beautiful though. And I wouldn't say I was homesick. That had anything to do with my slump, but I just things wasn't right. I lived in an apartment across the street from a little small college, and the kids are screaming and. I'm trying to run sprints, and it, dude, nothing went right. But anyway, I started the season out. I might have been six for 69. I blamed the wood bat, going from aluminum to wood. I was like, this stupid thing don't work. Um, the guys were throwing 90-plus miles an hour every day and wasn't used to seeing that. I was used to seeing 80, 85, but now they're throwing 90 consistently and throwing strikes. So that was the worst time of my life in the minor leagues where I felt like that if I didn't get hits, and I told the coach this, I was like, dude, if I don't get any hits today, I'm going home. And I was that close to quitting baseball my first year in the minor leagues. And um, something just got a hold to me. I ended up getting four hits that day, four for five, and ended up getting at least two hits 31 days straight and changed my whole career around, ended up hitting 323. But that was the worst slump I ever been in. In the big leagues, I didn't. I slumped a lot, but it was it wasn't that long, you know. That was long. That was, that was a lot of games where I didn't get any hits. But, but at least in the minors, I know at a personal level, it, it it it's rough to go through no matter where you are. But it's the minors. You're somewhat anonymous. But once you get to the majors and you're having a slump, and you've got the pressure of management you've got the pressure of your teammates of the media of your fans everything increases exponentially and so when you're going through something like that even a small slump once you're in the big leagues and you know that you're only as valuable as your stats and maybe the last few games that season what does it usually take to get over it is it back to the grind more batting practice or is there a mental hurdle that somehow you've got to jump over I, I i definitely now looking back i know it's more mental because the work you know the work was there i put the work in and the concentration in and um sometimes you have to back off and you may work overwork and do too much and i did that so i set out a game and it was in Atlanta, too, in 95, the year we won the World Series. I hit 257. I struggled the whole year. I didn't really help the team until the uh, – I had some big hits here and there, but I didn't really help the team until we got to the playoffs in the World Series. Probably had one of my best playoffs in World Series ever. But during that season, it was, it was, it was bad. I had, to, I had to lean on the rest of my teammates. They're, they're the ones who really picked me up and Bobby Cox – to where I don't don't worry about it and we had such a good team we were still winning without me being successful and I kept telling them the whole year and I think right around right after all-star break and I think I thought things would change you know the all-star break you take three or four days off and I'm coming back I said things gonna get better and I got off to another bad start so I probably went those whole three months and didn't do crap and I remember we're in Philadelphia and I got a game-winning hit Bad as I was playing, I came through with a game-winning hit. And the love and the joy from not doing that for a whole month and a half that my teammates showed me, and uh, it gave me – it made me feel so so much better and so much alive and a part of the team. That's how bad I was going. At that point, and I told myself, never, ever would I get that low again no matter how things are going. 
And I told them the next day when we were out on the bench, I said, hey, man, y'all just keep going. I'm coming. I'm coming. I promise you I'm coming. And that kind of – I kind of grew another inch. They believed in me, and, and, and I had another opportunity to show them how much they meant to me in that playoffs and World Series. I ended up having a real good one to get us over that hump to um, – to win that World Series, but they're they're bad and they hurt, and you out there all alone by yourself, and and I, like I said, I look back on it now, it's just a mental thing. If if I had to do it all over again, I probably would go back with Chipper's bat, just pick up his bat and go up there and hit, or try to hit left hand, anything, just to break that the cycle of the same routine over and over. Of course, and over Chipper again. might say, Marquise, that yeah. that's my bat. Excuse yeah, me. yeah, he, he wanted to know. <laughs> Well, I think it's fair to say that baseball obviously uh, worked out for you. But was there ever a plan B? You know, you get all the way to the minors, and let's say you didn't have that extra umph to get to that final level. Or maybe you did, and then the first year you have a career-ending injury, and, and that's it, and it's over. D- did you ever consider any alternative paths along the way? Yep. I always wanted to be a fireman. You know, growing up, uh, my neighbor's up the street, John Walton, who was um, – Probably the second, he was a fire chief for the Fulton County Fire Department, Fire Station 8 down there in Fulton County. And uh, he taught me how to fish. And I just thought, you know, he's chief of the fire department, putting out fires, saving lives. And, uh, wow, I'm going to be a fireman one day. I knew I was going to do something. I didn't know what, but I had a B plan and a C plan. I was going to do construction. I was going to paint. You know, I can do stucco, I can lay bricks, I can lay blocks. I do everything on the house except electricity work. I I, I was going to do something. I didn't I was I I was going to go to welding school. I was going to do a whole bunch of stuff. I didn't know what I was going to do, but I, I always knew that I was going to do something. I just didn't know what. So, a backup plan, I had a couple of them. <laughs> I just didn't know what I was going to do. Let's talk about the foundation. You founded the Marquise Grissom Baseball Association, I think pretty shortly after you retired, to not just coach baseball fundamentals, but also tutor kids to help prepare them for a standardized test for college. Why did you start the foundation? What were you hoping to achieve with it? Um, really to give each and every kid that come through the program an opportunity to learn more about themselves. Uh, we use baseball as a springboard to get them to further their education, to graduate from the next phase of their life to the to the next. Um, I was fortunate enough as a kid growing up, I had great coaches. My little league coach, Gary Stabb, is still coaching baseball 56 years, 57 years. This guy seen my talent at a young age of 9, 10 years old. He's seen the talent and he's seen the baseball IQ and – he honed in on that and pushed me a little bit more. Uh, T.J. Wilson, who really was my first coach, who coached me at seven, who taught me yes, sir, no, sir. My mom and them did a great job. They, t- he, they taught me all these things about more than just baseball, the off-the-field part, how to conduct yourself, attitude, and everything. So, um, Well, you clearly have a very good head on your shoulders. And the very fact that you had a plan B and a plan C – and you went to college uh, instead of chasing the the quick and easy victory early on. But a lot of kids, I imagine, don't know about the plan B and the plan C. Mm -hmm. They look at you as a role model in the world of sports, someone who excelled the elite to the elite levels in sports where this academic stuff doesn't really matter. So why spend so much time and energy on helping people prepare for what may be a plan B, plan C, when I assume most of these people are shooting for the stars, hoping that plan A, just like you, is going to work out for them. Mm-hmm. Education is the key. Education is the key. My parents were big on education. You know, get your education, you can do anything. Get your education, you can do this. Get your education, you can do that. And it's so important now, Glenn, um, you, you won't survive without an education. You won't survive without some kind of determination to to do something. Um, The love for something or to be loved. So it's 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 the financial literacy part where I made a lot of money. I blew a lot of money. I saved a lot of money. 
they didn't teach me or I didn't learn what to do with a million dollars when I got it. I knew that after I finished playing baseball, there's no other income coming in. So I had to create some income coming in while I was in baseball and then get prepared for baseball after baseball because I knew I was going to teach baseball. That's something that I know up and down, back and forth, the ins and out. And baseball is a, a booming business. So I'm not talking about just playing baseball on the field. I'm talking about it's a general manager part too. It's a marketing part too. It's a field maintenance part. It's all. It's a whole bunch of jobs up there in that human resource. If you don't know how to network, have an attitude to be willing to learn much as you can about people and about what you want to do for your life, it's going to be hard to be successful. So in starting the foundation, I just want to give back what I learned over all the years from my coaches, what I learned in A-ball, big leagues, 10 years, 15 years. I have a lot of information that I have to give off so I can grow. I want to grow. And I, so I have to give this information off to kids, to adults, to parents who didn't go to college and their kid getting ready to go to college, the, the parents to the, to the kid that's finna get drafted who have no idea what the draft is all about. And all that experience, I enjoy seeing people work hard because if you work hard, anything is possible. So the foundation is, is, is a lot more than just baseball. Going back to the odds I mentioned earlier, one out of 5,000 high school ball players will ever make it to the major leagues. Do you think the kids that come through your program, do they understand that? Do you make that transparent? Or do you want to enable each kid to think that they could be that one in 5,000? I mean, someone is going to be. You know, Why not them? Yep. I think every kid that comes to the program, they understand that they have to work hard. They understand that because I, re- I, I require them to know that a 3.0 grade point average or better is what we're shooting for. And every time you step out on the field, and we got a lot of kids who we know they're not going to play baseball, but they're out there and they're giving me 100% and they're growing just to see these kids grow because of the life lessons that you learn in this game of baseball because you're going to fail 70% of the time. And right there alone, if you're still playing baseball at the age of 14, 15, you already know what to expect on the baseball field. So if you're going to be out there on the baseball field, you best to have your behind working. Because if you don't, you're going to see the other guys pass you by. And then we get back into those numbers that you're talking about. Six guys out of the high school team go to college. And you start separating yourself. But those lessons that these kids learn in baseball – how to, to work hard, how to not to never quit. Because I believe sometimes you quit one time, you may quit again. And that's what we're trying to eliminate, no matter what you do, and not just baseball, in life, period. We want you to battle and work through it and overcome it and be more consistent and get more reps. And that's what baseball does for any individual that loves this game. And I think it will get the best out of you or you won't be playing it. So back when you were playing ball, it's pretty easy to measure success. Like we said, you live and die by the stats. It's very transparent. It's not so black and white with foundations. How do you measure the success? How do you know if you're making the kind of impact that you'd like to make? Um, When we have uh, 82, which I think is 86, I want to say my last quote was 82.9% of our kids that graduate from high school mean 99% of our kids graduate from high school, 82.9% college placement. I'm not worrying about how many kids get drafted and go to the pros. I want you to graduate from high school, maybe with some kind of honor, a 3.0 or better, and go to college. You want to prepare them for the plan B and the plan C. And if plan A happens, great, but let's, uh, <laughs> let's not uh, you know, throw right. all the marbles right. in that basket. We, we're planning for... Graduate from high school with honors. Go to college. Now, if we could get some scholarship dollars for baseball and academic, academic and baseball, what a beautiful combination. And and have them understand. I didn't understand when my coach gave me a full ride to go to college. 
that was that was fifty some thousand dollars. That's what the kid has to understand. If you get eighty percent or forty percent or twenty percent or fifty percent to go to college and you go out of state, that could be seventeen seventy. That's thirty six thousand dollars. You just save your parents. That's just like getting drafted. They don't understand that. They don't see that. So that's what I push in the organization to get a scholarship to go to college and to save your parents that amount of money and you getting an education for a, a, a portion of what it costs because the work you done put in, boy, we're growing up. We'll be becoming fine young men because some of our brightest minds are in college. They may not appreciate it at the time in the moment because it's not why they're there, but they'll look back in hindsight and they'll understand how valuable that was, you know, what you're doing to these kids. They will. When you've achieved the level of success that you've achieved in the sport, again, not just getting to the majors, but I mean being one of the best players within the league for that number of years, all the accolades that you achieved, you know, you've reached the pinnacle of your career so early in your life. How do you ever replace that sense of accomplishment, fulfillment, excitement, the adrenaline when it's finally over? I mean, how do you avoid spending the rest of your life looking back in the rearview mirror? I don't think I'll ever be looking in the rearview mirror. I think that um, <laughs> uh, when my mom was alive and I told her, I said, um, she's like, boy, you done made a lot of money, boy. I said, well, mama, the richness comes from the heart. You taught me that. I look at that and, and not not a dollar sign, and and I told her, I said, well, mom, I'm gonna I'm gonna do something greater than I ever did, and I hope you be here to see it, changing lives, and having an impact. I take that that uh, professional status of mine, and I didn't I I didn't like it at all when I was playing. I don't I don't I didn't like being a celebrity. I didn't like being a I just. I kind of wanted to be left left alone. Why didn't you like it? I'm in the moment. I'm I'm working. I'm playing. I'm I'm. That's my job, and I don't want no credit for it yet because it ain't over. <laughs> you know, I don't want no credit for it yet. It ain't over. And now, after my career is over, then hey, you got a pretty good career. That's cool enough for me. You know, I come from nothing, but love and happiness in the household, and just knowing how great of um, these two great people who made me, how hard they worked and what they sacrificed for me to have that opportunity to be a, a baseball player. The 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 fame and and all that stuff, it didn't it didn't mean then to now because now I utilize it to to get the kids to understand that anything is possible if you just set your mind to it, and not only that. To be able to change lives and have that kind of impact because, oh, he's a baseball player. I like it now because now I can get through to the kid. He he may believe me. He may understand that it does take hard work. He may understand it does take sacrifice. Like my own kid, you, you, you got to go to bed at night. You got to get up early and work. Now those things are the home runs and the doubles when a kid come back and say, hey, coach, appreciate what you did for me or when a kid I go out and watch a kid who was in the program now he's coaching and I could swear he was a little knucklehead kid never listened to nothing that I said and I go out there and look at him coach and he sound just like me you talking about the river mirror oh that's a whole bunch in front and that's over and done with and that was pretty good and I and I love it and I like it and I appreciate it and I respect it but this is what we do what we're doing right now is you almost can't compare winning the World Series to what we're doing now. You feel you get as much or even more out of this foundation than you did when you were playing ball? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The work is about to say it's hard, it's hard work no matter what. And that, that's no problem because that's what I'm accustomed to. But the satisfaction is a little bit sweeter. Who would you say has had the greatest influence in your life? My parents. Yeah, no doubt. And it's not even a question because I got those values from them. I got the work ethics from them. I got the love from them. You know, we had an acre garden and we would grow all our food 
for the for the winter time and we would share some of that in the garden with the people in our neighborhood and I never understood why till I was about 10 years old I worked so hard in that garden that you gonna give it away and now I see why when you get 12 and 13 14 years old because you got a little bit more than they got got crop and you share it with them and you share this with them so you know those are my heroes right there When you look back at all the success you had on the field, and of course you're having great success with the foundation as well, but in particular as a ball player, if you think about there's some set of ingredients that allowed for that success, some amount of it is just the hard work, the grit, the determination, the sacrifice that we talked about. Some portion of it has got to be just raw talent that you've got, and then maybe there's a little bit of serendipity or luck along the way what would you think about what's the primary one of those that really drove Marquise Grissom's success? I definitely believe it was luck because when I first got to spring training and I'm looking at these guys that were twice my size and was so confident and cocky and they were all number one draft picks, you know, telling me that they finna hit a home run and go out there and do it. And I'm like, those six guys in front of me and, high A, double A, and triple A, I'm never going to make it. If they ain't made it, I'm never going to make it. But things happen. One got hurt. One got traded. One got in trouble. And next thing you know, I slipped through the cracks. So there's definitely a lot of luck involved. Even even turning down the football in college, who knows what would have happened. Maybe you would have gone on to play both sports. Maybe you would have chosen football and then get injured. I mean, who knows? But uh, it's interesting. Yeah, a lot of luck. Well, my dad had a little persuasion in that, too. He told me I was too little. And then, of course, I wanted to prove him wrong then. And um, that was kind of a sign, you know, when I went to college. And, um, uh, okay, baseball going to work. But talent has a lot to do with it. I had a lot of talent. I knew I could jump high. I knew I could run faster than everybody. I knew I could throw harder than everybody. And uh, and I'm not talking about just – just everybody. I'm talking about everybody. I could throw the ball almost 100 miles an hour. I got drafted as a pitcher. So I'm throwing 97 miles an hour back then. And that, that was different now when everybody throwing 97. But back then, throwing 89 miles an hour, I had the talent. But uh, the hard work was there from my parents. And I just think along the way, just becoming a smart baseball player, then uh, even – trying to become a smarter person. Like I said, taking care of my body, you know, started hanging out all night. I did that at 21, 22, hanging out, drinking, and having a good time. And then all of a sudden you had your first kid. Things change. But some people don't want to change. And you have to put things in perspective now. And uh, I'll never forget coming out of that locker room. I struck out three times, then popped up with a man on third base, less than one out. And I was so mad. And I took it out on my kid when I came outside. And that was the last time. It was the first time and the last time. Uh, he wanted to play, and I didn't want to play. Get in the car, let's go. And I thought about that the next day, and I cried for weeks, man. Just He didn't do anything. And that kind of changed my whole attitude. And like I said, it's a lot of stuff that you pick up along the way about yourself that you have to change because if you disrespect baseball, baseball going to disrespect you. I don't care if you're a coach, player, equipment guy. Fan, if you disrespect the game in any kind of way, the game going to disrespect you. And that's what makes this game so unique because you can't hide. You can't hide in baseball. That ball going to find you every single time. If you could go back in time, jump in that time machine, and give the young 20-something Marquise some advice, knowing everything you know today, what would you say? I would have to say um, what Joe Black told me, Willie Stargell, Hank Aaron, and they told me these three things at 21. You can't make all the money, you can't drink all the liquor, and you can't have all the women, so don't try. That's what I would tell the kids today. And I would also add, clean up your social media page. That's what's killing our kids right now. Clean your phone up. You can't put your life out there on social media. That's affecting a lot of our kids today right now, keeping them from getting jobs, 
it's a it's easy to hide behind that that cameraman. They used to tell me all the time, if you don't come out in the wash, it'll come out in the wrench. <laughs> it's great advice. We'll end on that note. Marquise, uh, this has been great. Really enjoyed it. You're, you're a superstar both on and off the field, and uh, my hat's off to you for taking this stage of your life, this chapter, and uh, helping, mentoring, coaching uh, all these kids that, uh, that need people like you as role models. Well, thanks, Glenn. I really appreciate you having me. Hey, thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. You can subscribe to the show at iTunes, Stitcher, and theartofexcellence.com. I've got one small favor to ask. If you like the show, please take a minute and leave us a review on iTunes. I would really appreciate that. I'll see you next time.